Yeah, hello, and this is our live stream number 16. Um, today I want to talk about my signature guitars, pedals, and kind of endorsements that I have um, as a musician, not with blue guitar, and why I do that things. Well, what, what is it? What is it good for? Why we see these products and um, how did they come along? And even maybe what are the products good for? <clears throat> the other part will be Oliver Hartmann uh, from Avantasia. He is uh, a nice chap from Germany. Uh, yeah, we, we go back a long time, good friends. And he is telling his story. But let me start with the endorsement kind of thing. You know, being in the industry as a musician and um, also amp designer, um, I was freelance at the time, I was maybe more a musician back in the day um, than today, which I'm happy about being a musician, but I'm also happy about having a second kind of income and a second kind of job. And sometimes people wanted to see me only as the musician and sometimes they wanted to have me only as the guy that designs amps and stuff. But I actually like to wear both hats and I like to do both things because I think it complements and I can learn from being a musician and bringing this um, experience to the products. So it all makes sense for me. And um, it's not boring just being on tour for ages, you know. I have done all the tours and I know how it smells to be in a tour bus and uh, with the colleagues drinking and smoking and whatever, rock and roll life. Um, I've been there, but the thing is, um, I like to balance. I like uh, a little party and I like a little rock and roll and I like to, to have regular gigs and make music, M making music is the key. Um, and a little bit of that rock and roll life, but on the other hand, I also like to spend my time designing stuff and thinking about products. So, um, you know, being a, a demonstrator at trade shows, I have seen people coming up to me <laughs> waving with money and asking uh, me to play their guitars or whatever just to kind of promote something. But I've never ever did something that I wasn't um, happy about or something that I didn't like. So for me, you know, if it's never about the money, it's always about the product, it's always about is it good for me and, you know, um, do I really like what I do? So the thing is, um, uh, yeah, may maybe you have seen me with a couple of products, but for me, um, the, the vintage thing is something um, that I've done and the vintage thing is something that uh, yeah goes on for quite a while now, maybe 10 years, maybe longer. Uh, I have to tell you the story how the whole thing came along. So uh, this goes back to the Frankfurt Messe days where I was performing in the morning, 11 o'clock, whatever, bam, first demo and I had five demos a day, good time to practice so I enjoyed that. Um, playing a lot of demos, which is good. It's kind of paid practice in public, which um, is something that really makes you play better after a show. So um, one morning I came to the booth and I had my 61 Strat, which is downstairs today. Yeah, and the 61 Strat was sitting, you know, on a stand on the stage and I had to go for a quick pee because, you know, you wanted to play more relaxed. When I came back, there were already a lot of people lining up, waiting for me. And I was looking at the stand and I was kind of shocked. My 61 strut was there and kind of a fake of that strut was in there, in the, in the stand. And it had some plaster kind of thing, so you couldn't see the logo or anything. So what happened was people were waiting. I had to grab that guitar. It looked white. It was something. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, I thought, man, fuck, my strat is, is, is stolen. <sighs> anyway, I, I took that guitar, I started to play. I, halfway through the song, <laughs> I saw Trevor Wilkinson around, waving, holding my strat. And he was, okay, you know, giving me a big smile. And so I was totally relieved that my guitar was still there. Uh, wow. Okay. I finished the whole demo and um, there were another two songs to come. Okay, here's the real, here's the real stat. Okay, somebody brought it from downstairs. Um, yeah, it's all about white strats in my life. Um, and what happened is after my demo, he came and then he, he, he said, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about something affordable. And how did you like that guitar that you just played? Uh, it's my kind of new prototype. And I said, hey, it's not bad, um, but you know, the radius on the fretboard was a bit too flat for me. I like the vintage radius a bit more and blah, blah, blah. Of course, I always have stuff to complain about. And, and then, you know, and I said, you know, Trev, I highly respect what you're doing and, and your hardware and, and I know you do Fred King and um, why should I have another guitar? And then he said, you know, it's, it's something different. It's, it's something affordable. Maybe you need a spare guitar. And at that time, I spent already 10 years getting a copy of my original guitar, of my, my original Fender, which is uh, made from original Fender parts, I have a 1960 neck, I have a real Fender body and, and so on. That guitar is kind of my replacement guitar, my spare guitar. But to be honest, that guitar wasn't exactly what, like the real deal 61, the guitar that I always play. So um, why not having an affordable guitar with the same recipe like my real guitar? So, uh -huh. what's my recipe? Okay, I came up with a lot of things. I need my dummy coil, which we called buckle switch in the end. Yeah, here is one of those. Um, uh, yeah, you know what? I swap these guitars so we can actually have a go. And this this one here comes straight out of the box. You can see the original uh, tagger on it. Um, yeah, um, and So this really affordable guitar, um, I was asking for all my special features. First, I wanted the you know standard um, 21 fret job. I wanted the real, the vintage radius. Um, I wanted my 6005 uh, 6105 style frets. This is not uh, the original Dunlops, but uh, very similar frets. And then. Um, my dummy coil, which is with this switch, um, which is kind of the humbucking effect, reducing the hum. So we came up with the name Bucker Switch. <laughs> it has a treble bleed capacitor, um, so I can have these nice and clean tones when I, I'm on the low setting. Yeah, and there is an extra aluminum shielding plate, which um, makes the guitar a bit quieter, especially when I use here like my modern channel on the amp one with high gain and the boost, which is tons of gain.
Yeah. Um, and then, hey, you know, they even copied all the marks from the original one, you know? Let me show you, just to show the difference of <laughs> a real expensive guitar and a replica. Um, in the meantime, actually, the real guitar has been aged a bit more for my use. Mm -hmm. So this is like uh, the, this, how it looked 10 years ago. Um, yeah, and you can see um, it's getting dirtier every year and it's getting a few more marks here and there. Um, but you know, they, they basically copied all the cosmetics of that guitar and um, using like my specs. Um, on this guitar, they are, it's out of the box, it's the standard strings, I can play it right away. There is nothing um, I have done, not even a, um, a, a neck uh, set or anything. It's, it, it is, I can, and the missing screw is here, okay? Um, so for me, the whole project of doing that was do something good in a different price range. You know, on the one hand, it's great to talk about vintage guitars and the real deal and 20,000 euros or dollars or blah, blah, blah. But I hate it when people just, you know, kind of talk about money and uh, which is, it's not a good thing if you can, muse, can do your music only with equipment that is not affordable. I, I want, uh, you know, a guitar that everybody can buy. I want my gear to be accessible to other people. And that's the same story for like blue guitar or the vintage. And the vintage here is, is an example of how you can do a nice recipe at a different price range that still has the character, the vibe, the playability, the feel, and you know, major things. Of course, there is more quality a, uh, available but at an exponential price range you know so this is like if you go to the supermarket to the Aldi store and get a high quality product at a super affordable price if you go to a boutique store you you know handmade pasta whatever you pa you pay a, a three times the price and the quality is only a certain percentage better and this is kind of reduced to the max and that's what I like about a um, project like that. And this is why I actually do it. And so far, they sold a lot of guitars, maybe more than we all expected. So it must have been good. Nobody gets rich. Uh, maybe somebody gets rich. It's definitely not me. But my name is on it. And I'm proud of that. And um, it helped to spread my name in the industry. And that's good. So this was the story about that guitar. And then in 2010, I've done my Hendrix, Blue Place Hendrix um, DVD, which was like my attempt um, to have a go on Jimi Hendrix music. Jimi Hendrix, as you can see in the background, is a very important <laughs> uh, you know, factor in guitarist's life, rock guitarist's life. And for me, um, it was, it was of kind of in interesting to see what I would do with Jimi Hendrix music. And the thing about Jimi Hendrix music is it's actually very, very deep. Um, and the thing also is some of, this, uh, some, some of the songs like Crosstown Traffic, they still have a great beat, but I, I would I was kind of interesting, interested to modernize some of the Hendrix songs, not to do the a you know one one to one copy, which is some. It's not my cup of tea. I'm you know I, I will never be Jimi Hendrix. Uh, I just do my thing and I do it with Jimi Hendrix songs. So what I've done here. actually goes like this.
I did like a pop version of that famous um, Jimi Hendrix song and I did similar things with other Jimi Hendrix songs. And then I thought, you know, if I'm the guy with the white strats that plays his instrumental music all the time, um, it, it's, it's not cool. I, I wanted the visuals of a Jimi Hendrix project. And then I came up with the idea, you know what? I make a Jimi Hendrix style strat with my features so I can play it with my bucker switch, with my all the electrical uh, features with the treble pleat capacitors. And just having the reverse headstock so it looks like, you know, Hendrixy, like uh, I have, um, <laughs> I would be, you know, different. And um, that's about the idea. So, and to get there, I ordered, um, yeah, some raw materials from vintage, um, you know, like the reverse headstock neck. And I also got the bodies and um, then I had somebody hand painting them. You know, so this is, this is the prototype that is hand painted. And that's um, Daniel Hahn, a guy who's the son of a advertising um, agency boss here from my hometown Saarbrücken. Um, and he's actually a great artist himself. Uh, and <laughs> but drawing flowers and this hippie thing wasn't so cool for um, many guitars. So you know, I started with two guitars, and I've done. Um, the DVD and I've done also a tutorial DVD for how to play the music of Hendrix and here you can see the prototype. This is the guitar that you can see. And then, you know, this kind of thing got pretty popular and people saw me playing that guitar and also when I did the tour following up um, the DVD, um, I was seen with, you know, this kind of iconic guitar. And then people asked me, where can I buy this guitar? And what happened is I asked Vintage if they could do uh, this guitar like in mass production. And they said, no, we're not sure. And then said, okay, guys, you know, I ordered two prototypes. Can you sent me 80 bodies and 80 necks so I can make 80 guitars, I will sell them. Okay, sure. So they delivered the necks, they delivered the bodies and Daniel had to paint 80, 80 guitars. <laughs> and you know, he's about, he, or then he was about 20 or 18 or you know, teenager. And you know, the first five guitars came pretty quick but then he got kind of sick of painting flowers and hippie style. Uh, he's more the st urban street guy and uh, everything was slower and slower. But anyway, in the end, we did finish 80 guitars. We sold the 80s, 80 guitars. I, I kept a few uh, for myself. And then Vintage came along and made a serial model, which is like this one. This is straight out of the box. And the paint job is simply a copy of one of these hand painted ones. So every of these hand painted ones is slightly different. So this is like one of them. And it's a very thin decal. And what I like is <laughs> we actually put it simply over the body from the relict standard white one just having the different colors on top of it. And so it became something pretty nice and unique. And this...
yeah, so this became the Summer of Love guitar. Uh, of course, we had to come, come up with a name that is not trademarked in a way. Uh, yeah, this became that guitar. Um, and the story goes on. Since this guitar is so colorful, I've been invited to promote that guitar in China. So I had the pleasure to, to fly to China and promote that guitar in like 10 cities. It was crazy. People loved that design and, you know, um, they don't know about Jimi Hendrix. They just know about what it is. And some people like that kind of colorful guitar. All good. So, you know, um, here's the story of the vintage guitar. And Trev Wilkinson and myself, you know, we, we, we are friends for decades. We, we still are in contact. This is uh, a picture in his workshop where in the UK, in, in the Southport, north at, at the coast. Um, yeah, and this is a picture where I show him my wirings in my 61 Strat. Maybe you can notice there's some shielding, paint, all that stuff that I've done in the 80s. You know, I've been experimenting. I'm just happy that I didn't route um, it for hamburger. So I was always a single coil guy and I didn't have to <laughs> cut the wood and put a hamburger in there. But besides that, I tried a lot of things, um, luckily not destroying the substance of that guitar. Yeah, so this, this is my story with the vintage guitars. And um, they do have the, the mojo and the feel. Of course, at that price range, the quality is what it is, which means there's a little tolerance. If you get a good one, it's a killer guitar. And some maybe not that good, but you know, look for a good one and you get such a great in instrument. So that's, that's my um, two cents on the vintage guitars or on my signature models on the, that, these guitars. Yeah. And then talking about China, um, there is um, on one of the trade shows, I, I was um, using, I think I, I, I forgot my delay pedal. Usually I use a Boss DD2 um, and then, you know, I was looking for a delay pedal and then what came along was this x D5. It's an um, analog delay. Nothing special, just a simple analog delay. Time, volume, feedback, delay. Hmm. But when I played that delay, I thought, that sounds good. Um, let me show you. And, ah, okay. I need to plug that into the effects loop. Uh, 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 wait a minute. This goes here. And then we have a send. And we have a return. Too many pedals already, but it's all good. So. Switch off this. Can you hear the echo? So the specialty of this delay is it's not too bright, it doesn't, it, it sounds analog, but it doesn't sound dull. It has a warm, can you hear? It has a warmth to it, like. can do all the analog uh, tricks with it. Um, here comes the next level. I can use that pedal in front of the amp as well. Uh, okay, I had this pedal hooked up. Let me ah, simply get rid of that here. No problem. 
and use it instead of um, this one here. Get rid of this is my input, and this is sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, that's rock and roll. Um, so now this is the guitar that goes into the delay and then the output goes into the amp one. And this is where it really shines. Now I show you what I do with this on the vintage channel, which is like my... Okay, you get a picture. So I was kind of impressed by this little pedal. Okay. And then of course you start talking. It's like, hey guys, you know, you're from China. What's it? And then, oh, it's only whatever, 50 bucks. Uh, oh, that's cheap. Um, you know, very, very affordable pedals. And then of course we started talking and they showed me some other pedals that they have produced. And some of them were actually shit. <laughs> and I was honest and this was the beginning of a great relationship because I believe honesty is building a foundation of you can feel a person and this was the moment where I talked to the boss of that company his name is Mao Fischer and I met him later on is in his uh, factory in China. Uh, that's the guy in the middle of the picture. And then, of course, um, yeah, we, w w he showed me some overdrive pedals and I said, hey guy, you know, that's, your delay is so beautiful, but the overdrive pedals you, you have there, they're not good. Uh, so, and this was the moment where we started um, to work together and I I thought I will never do a cheap overdrive pedal with blue guitar because for many reasons. First, there are so many pedals on the market already. So I don't want to step into um, a product range where everybody is offering a product. Um, I will never be the cheapest, um, even if I'm the best, but what is the best? And you know, everybody tries to scream, I'm the best, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, it's great to support somebody that has affordable pedals and make those pedals a higher quality. So this was our first project. It's called the Golden Brownie. Well, you know, Brownie stands for brown sound, Marshall-esque tones and Golden Brownie is, uh, I came up with the idea because, uh, yeah, you know, it's a cookie, it's everything. It's uh, playing with words. Um, so, let me show you this pedal and uh, getting rid of this. So, power works. Um, okay, I'm back on the clean channel. Let's hear the clean channel first. Okay. Clean channel, reverb, that's all. And now the gold brownie. Uh, 
Let me check the clean sound. Okay, this would be kind of a, a clean tone that I would use. So this is on full here. And this is on Yeah, so, you know, there's your clean tone and... Any amp can have a decent clean tone, I hope. <laughs> and then, you know, you can get a really affordable, tiny pedal called Golden Brownie and get a decent uh, plexi tone. I mean, Eddie-style plexi tone, you know? <laughs> Okay, those two controls, um, they have similar things, but I think um, the way they are voiced helps to get this particular Marshall-esque bite. There's a certain thing about 4-7K which <laughs> is Marshall-esque. If it's not enough, you don't have to bite, it's not rock, it's just uh, too smooth. And you can dial this in with these, like, these two controls, okay? So that's the golden brownie. Um, the next one in line is, I think it was Dyna Rock. Yeah, I think it was the Dyna Rock. So this was the idea of, okay, now we have one pedal, let's do another one. <laughs> and uh, since the first one was kind of a success, and here is the... Dino Rock. Bypass. And Dino Rock. It says Dyna Rock, and this is what it is, Dynamic Rock. Okay, um, maybe boutique tone at not boutique price. Um, yeah, so this was the next pedal. What was then? Okay, we had um, a pedal called the Tube Squasher. And this one I show you is a low gain pot pedal, which is kind of 
You might think of a tube screamer, but it's not. Let me show you. Bypass. Ah, okay, master. So here's your standard clean. That's kind of a boost, but it's a very compressing, blooming boost, but it has still a nice cut at the transients. So, you know, dynamic is my middle name. <laughs> I like stuff that is dynamic. So, I mean, it sounds tube, so it's the name is tube, and squasher means it's kind of tube squashed, like a squashed, you know, cranked tube amp. And it has um, a low switch. sounds of on the edge of breaking up. Another thing is you can use that pedal as a boost in front of the vintage channel. First the vintage by itself. It's a killer pedal to boost things. Maybe sometimes even better than the Tube Screamer or the Green Frog behind me. Um, tube Squasher. Okay, next in line, the third is a pedal that kind of is similar to this one, but still different. It's called, oops, ah, it has already power. Ah, fucking power, get this one. Um, this pedal is called the Sweet Lion. Sweet Lion. The Sweet Lion is another low gain overdrive and it has a special blend control. What's the, it's called the squash here or was it a growl? Maybe that's still a prototype. Anyway, so check out this pedal. Um, okay. Uh, back to clean.
to me that's kind of a Vox AC30-ish sound. <laughs> So that's that side here, okay? You know, it's kind of that clean, compressed, you know, polite. It's a polite voicing. I'm not say saying polished, but it's a polite. <laughs> so on the other side, we have a, a real dirty, more like my 57 Tweet Deluxe, you know, 636 single ended. <laughs> to the other side. Other side. Over compressed, but it's a blend control, so. So you can kind of dial in the filth and the dirt on this uh, control here. Well, these are the pedals I've done with X-Wife. And then they came along with another <laughs> nice thing, which is the wireless. And when they showed me their prototype, I had to say, hey guys, nice idea to have a super affordable compact wireless these days it's been copied by many other companies but this was the very beginning of affordable wireless and I gave them some advice how to um, make this sound better and it's super easy to use um, switch on there's four um, channels so you could have like four of these on stage Plug it in the guitar, plug it into the amp, and no cable required anymore. So we can... Okay, <laughs> well, the, the pedal is out of the signal path now. Um, I get fooled by too many lights. Um, okay. Let me use the drive of the amp one. wireless has a little noise but we tried to make it as low as possible which is important especially for me when I use high gain sounds and use the guitar on a super low uh, setting <laughs>
yeah. So for the price and the usability, I also think it's a very good product. By now there are more uh, wireless products on the market, um, but it's still, you know, I still like them. They're good, they're easy to work with, and they have a very nice sound. Sound is to me the most important thing. Um, and super affordable. Yeah, so having this kind of relationship with other manufacturers, with my friend Fischer from China, um, is a big benefit also for me with Blue Guitar. So um, I decided that he not only produces this for himself and the pedals, I also gave him the Blue Box to manufacture for Blue Guitar. So in his factory, um, they do the Blue Box. <laughs> and I've took, taken a few pictures where you can see the Chinese mentality, which is funny. Um, you know, um, everybody works for the, the team. It's, it's a team thing. Um, people are people all over the, the planet. And uh, it's just different uh, philosophies that work. Um, yeah, and China is impressive. Um, but on the other hand, um, if I wouldn't be manufacturing the Blue Guitar products in China, I would not be able to offer Blue Guitar at such a price. Um, and that's a big, big decision. I mean, if this would be manufactured in Germany, it would be at least 50, maybe 80% more. And um, it is a learning curve how to work with Chinese manufacturers. And um, I think we've been there and what we've got out of production for Blue Guitar is spot on. I have to say they do what they are told. We have full control and it's a very trustworthy relationship so we can be sure that we are not shipping shit in boxes, which also can be China manufacturing, <laughs> but it's not our level. And so, yeah, we have, um, we have chosen the right uh, suppliers. And of, of course, having a friend who is a, manufacturing, a manufacturer himself, living in China, being Chinese, being a great guy that knows the industry, that knows sourcing, actually does help a lot and helps me to make blue guitar products um, at best quality for the blue guitar customers. So it's, it's a, a good, good relationship. And uh, if something goes wrong in China, I know somebody to call that can yell, speak in Chinese and does things because I help them with uh, the pedals and I'm not getting one cent and I don't want to get any money from him. You know, it's not about money. It's I help him, he helps me and that's our relationship. Yeah, cool. I think we should uh, get to the questions. I can see some questions here. Um, I see, ah, the first hint is this amp. It's not switched on. Okay, <laughs> let's switch on the Iridium. Now, how does this look? Nice? Right. Um, and this here, let's go all the way. The purple blue, and that's kind of um, a German uh, uh, word is Schwarzlicht. I don't know the, the English one. It's, it's the one that when you go to the disco, and uh, everybody has super white teeth. <laughs> so this is the, the, the nice color on the Iridium edition. Okay, um, question here. Carsten Funk, um, uh, three days ago, uh, he has a, a question on the Academy of Tone number 13. Um, 
mentioning Pink Floyd, I was mentioning Pink Floyd, of course, Pink Floyd needs to be mentioned. Um, how about covering David Gilmour gear and sounds? Actually, good idea, because um, first of all, I'm a big fan of um, uh, David Gilmour. He is the master of the right notes. He plays notes that mean a lot and his technique is not about being the fastest <laughs> shredder on the planet. No, but he plays the right stuff at the right moment with the right tone. And his tone has always been breathtaking. You know, even back in the 60s or 70s in the early records, he was at the forefront of the guys that had a good tone. And even before I played the guitar, I was listening to music and I remember that Pink Floyd is, was fascinating to me. You know, Wish You Were Here, bow, 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 killer, you know. So David Gilmore is, is, is a good subject to cover and I met him. So that's, okay, I put this on the list, Gilmore is on my list. Mm -hmm. mm. <clears throat> Next one is Jens Gallich. Uh, German. Hallo Thomas, was ist für dich im Vergleich zwischen einer 50er und 60er Strat der Unterschied, der dich zu 60ern hingezogen hat? Okay, I translate. Uh, what's the difference between a 50 Strat and a 60 Strat? And why do I prefer more 60 Strat? Yeah, well, put it that way. There are 50 Strats that I like, but in general I prefer 60s. What's the difference? 50 strats have maple necks, um, unless we are talking about 59. A 58 strat is a maple neck Stratocaster. In 59, they have rosewood uh, fingerboards. Um, is my... No, anyway, it was there. Um, you will see it in a minute when, when, uh, when we do the interview. Um, I have a maple strat which is coming up next here. And um, what's the tonal difference? I think that the 60s strat they have a different bite. And the 50s they have more mids in a way and they have a, a rounder mid kind of thing. So I would say the 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 50s are perfect for clean tones um, and they have, they don't have the bite, they have a different bite. And I, I, I personally prefer 50 strats for clean tones, jazzy things, strats and jazz works too. And um, the other thing is um, bluesy stuff on a maple strat that makes also a lot of sense. But me being a rock player, the 60s Strat, they, they, they have something that I think is rock. And therefore I prefer 60s Strats. And uh, 61 is a magic year. I didn't know when I bought my 61 Strat that that's such a magic year, but uh, Rory Gallagher Strat is a 61. And some other famous uh, players have 61. Gary Moore has a 61, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, next one. Um, Paul Schlachter, can you demo the golden brownie with humbuckers, please? Yes, I can. Let's do that. Um, mm -hmm. And ah, I answer the next question in the meantime. Um, What's my preferred setting of neck deflection, which is like, um, um, let's put it that way. I like it as yeah, uh, straight as possible. They should be that straight. Maybe the camera can show that. So if I touch the first fret and the last fret, there is almost nothing in between here. So it's like straight. There's just a tiny little bit of room between the string um, and, the, and the middle frets. And of course, the frets have to be even to do that. If not, um, you have rattling like crazy. And that's the way I 
set up the strats. Okay, let's hear the golden brownie with humbuckers then. Uh, humbuckers, we do have humbuckers in my Les Paul. Yeah. And then we need a golden brownie, which is here. And we go power and we go output and we go guitar and we go input where's the guitar lead here and we need that connected to the clean channel oops that's loud uh, let's start with a clean sound first before we do enough. So that's the golden brownie with hamburgers. It is not a metal sound, it's a classic rock tone, which is uh, kind of natural tight, not too tight. And it has this um, focused mids, which is uh, something that I like. Okay, um, next question. Patrick has, when you try out a new amp or get one at the gig jam, what do you do to adjust your sound first gain first EQ can you show us the process okay I can show you the process I can do something like this no tone everything on zero and then uh, when I show up at a gig I play a strat <laughs> sorry guys there's nothing wrong about my nice Les Paul but I go back oh, let's have my real 61 just for a change so what I usually do is I put the, the EQ somewhere in the middle and then see what I need. Okay, I actually don't need much clean tones. So the clean will be just some volume. Okay, works. Next thing is my tone is something in between overdrive. And what I need is like... Where is the sweet spot for gain? So, first thing is like... Maybe you can hear that it's already like a little loose. I personally like that. As a hint for you guys is I wouldn't go all the way where I, I do it because my playing style um, is 
using the volume a lot. So I, I'm not playing on 10 all the time. I'm more playing like six, seven or lower, like this. So that would be a sound for me, but I still have more gain on tap. But for you guys, that's too much. If I would, would be uh, not me and use the guitar on 10, I would put the guitar on 10 and would search for the point where the low end is still tight, but not too thin. So this would be around seven on the M1 now. Okay, talking about EQ, I know um, the M1 is not uh, a typical amp. So M1 in the middle position is always good and then you just reduce or dial in a little bit more of what you see, bass, mid, treble. On a classic amp, the treble kind of influences the middle. So on a classic amp you have to be sure that the amount of mids is still there when you increase treble in case you want more treble or that you don't get too much mids when you decrease the treble. So the way I do it is like... Um <laughs> To me, that sounds muffling. So, that sounds good to my ears. It has this little extra bite, and maybe it's too much now when I just play just by myself. Um, but when the band and the cymbals come in place, the extra high end is something nice. Check what I'm doing with the middle. I'm, the middle needs to speak. All the way up is too honky for me. Sounds telephone, but like, you know, five or six. I put it on four. Oh, that's scooped. You know, this is kind of the vocal frequencies that kind of hold the guitar together. And then the bass. I love bass. <laughs> um, but beware of your situation. If there's other guitar players and the bass player, maybe you have to be a bit more careful about that. Me playing in a trio, a lot of bass is allowed. Um, so for you guys, depending on the band, be careful. So and now I do my Thomas Blue trick, gain on full and reduce it on the guitar. Which sings a bit more and it also works for the other. Maybe I like eight better. <laughs> Ah, I got the boost on, so that's... So that's the way I deal with the knobs, the frequencies and what I need. But I think the main things is the right EQ, speaking mids just enough that you 
that the guitar really cuts through high end that is in my taste just a touch too much and uh, bass as much as it's allowed then the guitar sounds huge I mean that's that's the thing and if there's two more players on stage you have of course to to reduce the frequencies then you probably go more mid-rangey and then you have your focused mid-frequency area where you kind of live in the band mix yeah okay um, and the, the order like uh, it's a ping pong I, I, I do a little bit of gain to, to have a starting point and then I do the EQing and then I revisit the gain a bit but uh, since I know what I want I, f I find it really quick okay but uh, that's my job okay next question here Kevin J um, wait a minute. Um, Kevin J Thomas um, is the low frequency output transformer speaker resonance modeled in the M1 ah it's a huge aspect of tube amps feel and something the X effect power amp into cap doesn't properly replicate yes um, we do have um, to, we have we know about the low end and this is what is happening in our current feedback design and uh, it's inside our schematics yes it's there we just don't have a separate control for it but we ha have all the characters so when you listen to our a b comparisons you can see that we do it properly but not having too many knobs on the M1 because uh, it's kind of inside our design. Okay, Patrick has when you try out. Oh, so that's, I had this question. Next one, Darren West. Hi Thomas, I just purchased an M1 Mercury. That's this one. Do you have an, uh, any experience pairing it with the Line 6 HX effects? Yes, actually, there's many people doing that. Um, we have a board like that in the company I'm more the analog effects guy but um, I will have a, a future episode just on that topic on the four cable cable method combining the amp one with the you know like modern digital multi effects especially like the H uh, effects please go to the user group and I think there's even an HX effects user group with the M1 um, there's a lot of things you can find on Facebook um, and there is a guy in Nashville Nathan McFarland Nathan McFarland and he is Mr. HX effect meets M1 Mercury edition so he has tons of video out, videos out and there's more just go on YouTube and you will find some buddies doing that and they are happy to share their knowledge with you and uh, tell you you know little uh, tricks how to deal with the HX effects because it's kind of a complex thing um, be aware that it needs a bit of time here and there but it can be a magical combination okay so um, next one can you Alcandari okay Khaled okay can you um, do the Hank Marvin shadows echo delay um, I could not with this one I would rather have my um, using Ketner delay let's put it that way I saved that for another episode I think I've done it in an earlier episode when I was talking about the fascination of tape delays uh, must be around episode 5 or so so please check that one um, because what is the beauty of the shadows echo um, you know back in the days he was using a real tape delay and you have multiple uh, repeat heads uh, repeats from different heads and there's kind of like a little rhythmic structure that comes back from the echo that's very well 
characteristic for the shadows delay. Um, yeah, please check my earlier episodes. It, it's it's something about echoes. Uh, yeah, Academy of Tone number question mark, the one with the echoes. The full, it's a full episode on on tape delays and more. Okay, next question here is. Um, I use the X-Wife guitar wireless with my Stratocaster, no issues ever, but doesn't work with my active bass. Um, why don't they work with active pickups? Um, that's a good question. I think it's not designed to have the headroom. Um, just use it with passive pickups. Um, yeah. They started the design. I was just double checking that it sounds right. Um, the the way um, for bass, I didn't check. Yeah, sorry, that's the way it is. Um, okay, next question here. What kind of volume pots are on your strats, audio or linear? Um, it's all audio. Um, logarithmic potics. Uh, poti you, I mean, this is why. See, when I I like to have like a, a a lot of spread in the low register when the the volume is just on one, and then like a kick down on the last three um, numbers on the volume control. Wow, so this is uh, the question for today. Um, I had a lot of questions uh, to my dear friend Olli Hartmann and um, we recorded that interview earlier. Um, yeah, you should check out Olli Hartmann and there is a lot of um, uh, things he has to say. There's one last question. Is there a last question? Oh, wait a minute, I, I just... No? Uh, next stream is the Neigum. Ah, okay. One guy is um, Stefan Hardekopf uh, in German. I, I just finished the question. Hallo Thomas, nutzt du Next Shims, um, um die Neigung des Halses bei der Strat zu optimieren oder beeinflusst den Sound zu sehr? Okay, the, the question is, if you have Neck Shims, which is like a little plates that you usually put between the neck and the body to kind of have a different angle of the neck. Sometimes the neck is, put it that way, it, it's not perfectly in line with the body. So you, you kind of put something underneath here to have a slight angle of that, um, and that's called a neck trim. Um, and if you don't do that, you have to, to, to compensate it with the saddles. So I have a certain position where I like my saddles at. They should be low, not too high. And um, therefore, it's, it's okay to use something like that. But to be honest, um, if I go all the way, I like the, the neck having direct contact with the body. And uh, so I try to avoid that. Um, to have a quick fix, it's okay to do something like that, but um, um, I'm, I'm, if, if, if I know exactly what I want, I can get the guitar, um, like on my main guitars, I get that um, s with sandpaper or somebody that, that really um, makes makes it so even that nothing else is needed in between. On the other hand, it also works. You lose a little bit of sustain, but okay. It's more important that the angle is right uh, that, um, than to have uh, the thousand percent contact. But once you know your right angle, everything is in place, you know, in the long term, then you can even, you know, make make the connection between neck and body 100% contact. So that's the answer. Now, next, please welcome 
Mr. Olli Hartmann, a dear friend of mine who is playing in a very famous project from Germany, Avantasia. Avantasia, they tour the world. He's got his uh, Pink Floyd project Echoes and he also has his own solo career, Hartmann. So enjoy our little interview, which is the next 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, Olli Hartmann, I think we know each other for many years. I've seen you on so many trade shows at Frankfurt, Frankfurt Messe back in the days. Um, That's right, yes. I, yeah, I saw you playing, you know, playing your ass off. And uh, for me, it was always the best time to get practice. You know, I had like three, four, five, six, seven demos a day. And by the end of a trade show, I was in good shape, so to speak. So yeah, that's, what was... that's absolutely right. I can I can still remember that that uh, uh, playing the first shows on this music fair was in the beginning of the '90s for Jörg Tandler and this company Morgan Guitars. And yeah. I was, I've been going to a studio extra for this to record some demos and playbacks and stuff and and to to yeah to do the best on the music fair and to be seen as a guitar player. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is my Tandler guitar, and this goes back even I don't know very long time ago. I forced Jörg Tandler to do guitars in a classic shape. Before that, he was doing his own fancy designs, which were killer. Yeah. No, but yeah. I was, you know, I had a friend who is a collector and he had a 56 Stratocaster maple neck. And of course, uh, I couldn't buy it uh, for many reasons, too expensive <laughs> and too good, <laughs> so he wouldn't sell it. Um, too good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Jörg did a copy of that guitar for me and it's like... You know, it has a... It's a maple strat. I'm not the typical yeah. maple strat guy, but um, it has a V-neck. But the, yeah. the work uh, Jörg did was was good. And this is, you know, he makes good guitars. They have Absolutely. solid, yeah. yeah, super body, super necks. And um, the color is, um, I call it Katzenburst, uh, cat burst. <laughs> cat <laughs> <You> burst. Meow. <laughs> 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 yeah, meow. So, and, when you were at the Messer show, you played his guitars back then. That's right. The, the, the story behind this is that we know each other since our, not childhood days, but, but, but youth days. Okay. We grew up in the same town close to Frankfurt. Yeah. Not the same town, but the neighbor towns, uh, still fighting against each other in the early <laughs> days, the neighbor towns. And uh, uh, he was growing up in Waldorf and I was growing up in Merfelden. It's, it's both ah, but... close to Frankfurt. And, and he repaired my first, my first electrical guitar because I had some problems with the tremolo and, 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 and uh, the nut. Uh, it, it never stayed in tune. And, and then I was asking in the music shop uh, who could maybe do it. And they said, like, go to Jörg Tandler. He could fix it. And yeah. I think I was uh, 16. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 16. And he was around 19 or so. Yeah. 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 Really and, funny. And on the trade show, when you played it, um, was this a Les Paul or was this like a Strat type? What kind of uh, guitars of Jörg did you demonstrate back then? Uh, on the first, on, uh, back then in the, in the days, uh, on the first two fairs, I, I played his Stratocasters, mm -hmm. his Morgan Strats. I, I still have the number one. Uh, it, it was uh, Sonic Blue in the beginning uh, when, I, yeah. when I started playing it on the fair. And, and when I said, like, can I have it? Can I buy it? So like, okay, you play for the fair and you can have the guitar. And uh, I wanted him uh, to turn it into Olympic white. Ah. And uh, uh, yeah, it's not Olympic white anymore. It's more like yellow now. <laughs> uh, sure. uh, lo lo lots of patina, but it's, it's, it's still uh, maybe the best Stratocaster that I have. Yeah. I have two guitars, uh, two Stratocasters of him and one Les Paul, his, his model, uh, model Beauty, yeah. uh, which I got years later. And they are both, uh, uh, yeah, the, maybe the best guitars that I have. Yeah. Cool, yeah, yeah. But um, you also hold an FGN guitar, so... Uh, That's right, yeah, yeah. Is this like your signature guitar or...? The, this special model here is, is my signature guitar. 
I, I, I started to work with them 10 years ago when I met them on the fair. Right. Uh, they were on the same booth as T-Rex, where oh, yeah. I, I did demos too for T-Rex. And uh, very cool guys. And mm -hmm. yeah, so, so I started to, to, to watch the guitars and play them. And so I was like, wow, great guitars. Uh, it's a Japanese company called Fujigen. Yeah. who did uh, OEM production in the early <laughs> days. They still do it for Ibanez and others. And, and, and they did uh, the famous JV series for Squire, yeah. the very yeah. sought after early 80s series. And they, they make great guitars uh, and they always have an open ear for, for new ideas and for musicians, yeah. uh, what their exp expectations and needs are for, for instruments. And uh, yeah, the, uh, I started to play their guitars 10 years ago and I'm really, really happy. I use them on every tour and, and also on recordings, really happy with them. Yeah, what, what's the specialty? There's no covers on the pickups, so the covers kind of... Uh, yeah, have, the, yeah um, this, this, this model of, that I have, the signature model, is a little different. Uh, the, the, let's say the basic model is, is the LS20, which is kind of the same with a, with a, a mahogany uh, body and neck. Uh, a maple top and a, and a maple, uh, a thin maple, how, how do you call it on top? Furnier is German? What Polished is or whatever. No, no. <laughs> a thin, uh, a thin uh, ah, uh, piece um, of uh, maple uh, on top uh, of yeah, the maple uh, top. Furnier in German and it's a, uh, fuck, I forgot a word in English. You know, we will thin, find it out. A very I think thin what layer everybody of, knows what we're talking about. Yeah, a, thin a very layer, thin, a thin, thin layer. layer of wood. A you thin know? layer of maple on top of the maple top, <laughs> yeah. and which, give, which gives it uh, an, an, uh, yeah, a very beautiful optic. Right. As yeah. A, uh, yeah, as a as a ten top guitar, PRS would call it a ten top, and uh, but of course you can you can produce it for a much cheaper price than than uh, trying to get this as a as a massive maple yeah, yeah. top. Sure. Um, the, this is the basic model, and the, the things that I changed is uh, uh, the, the, this color, this, this let's say green, gray, black color, um, mm -hmm. and, and this uh, pickups without covers. Mm -hmm. um, these pickups come from Seymour Duncan. This is an, an SH18, this whole lot of humbucker, which is kind of a rewound uh, uh, puff. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And the one that I have on the neck, it's, it's different than on, on the normal model, is an SH2. Uh, uh, the the jazz version with a with an Al Nico two I think, uh, ah, okay. which mm -hmm. is a little more clear on the neck for for this special guitar, uh, and and yeah I have uh, vintage tuners so so the main hardware is all vintage like like an old ABR bridge, uh, uh, an aluminium stop tail piece um, starts directly into the body and and I have a fifties wiring I think this ah, yeah. is the only model that has got a fifties wiring. Yeah, 50s yeah. wiring to me is also key to the sounds that I like in the Les yeah. Paul. But yeah. but for me, you are the kind of a Les Paul expert, and I I kind of uh, approached you a bit more when I've done, you know, the M1 Iridium edition. When I was moving from the very first one to the to the next one, you know, I thought, okay, I need some fresh blood here. I need some people that play different. <laughs> That do you I'm, know? I'm, that I'm 50. I'm not. I'm not fresh anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you you do your thing, and this is the great thing. But still looking um, good. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And um, so you know, um, I, I I'd like to the way that you you, you know we, we had a little contact, and then you you had a few ideas how to tweak the M1 and how to make it tighter and stuff, and this was all fitting in into my concept of getting a new product out, which later became, you know, the black one, uh, the Iridium edition. Um, and you gave a lot of input to that. And you even came to Saarbrücken, you came to uh, the Blue Guitar headquarters, and we tweaked a little things here and there. And you took a prototype on the road with Avantasia, which is the big, yeah. uh, well-known band you toured the world with. Um, maybe we should uh, tell people a little bit about that project. Uh, it's it's huge. I've seen you here in Saarland Halle, which is like the biggest hall in our county. Um, Your county. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so what is this metal pop project? What 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 is Avantasia? I, I would call it a, a something between a hard rock and metal all star project. It was founded uh, in 1999 by Tobias Summit, the singer and, and songwriter, 
And he called me in early 2000, if I like to join this project, as a singer, not as a guitar player. And uh, uh, sang, sang some tracks, uh, some, some vocals and also choirs. And uh, during that time, nobody uh, was even believing or uh, could imagine that this would become that famous as it is now. And, yeah. and uh, also, the f already the first record was, was really very good selling. And, and uh, we started to tour with this project at the first time in 2008. Before that, yeah. uh, everybody thought it's not possible with that many singers uh, you have on a record and that many uh, musicians to bring that on stage. But in the end, uh, he did it and, and it was, was great since then to be on tour. I think we, we did it last year in 2019 for the fifth time. Uh, we tour every second or third year with a new record. And uh, it's a great project, great people, great yeah. singers as Jeff Tate, as Ronnie Atkins of Pretty Maids, uh, yeah. uh, Bob Catley of Magnum. Um, Many, many more. Jon Lander, an amazing metal singer, yeah. and, and many, many others. So and it's yourself. always great fun to be with this uh, band on tour. Yeah, and, and yourself. Me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Oli the, the has... The a, little me. Yeah, the little Oli has a four octave span, which he can sing. I, I had, I had. <laughs> <laughs> I, I well, had, I had. Uh, maybe it goes lower these yeah, days, yeah, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's, um, I, I was making a lot of music with Thijs van Leer from Focus, you know, in okay, my band, yeah. and he, he used to yodel and he used to scream all the way up high. But over the years, his voice kind of was sinking down. So he still had a, a bunch of octaves, but the, the range just shifted. <laughs> a bunch of octaves. <laughs> <laughs> he got yeah. a bunch of I think octaves? I, 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 I still think I have a, like, like a small bunch of octaves still, <laughs> but it's, yeah, like when you get older, the voice gets lower. But it yeah. also has got this positive effects that you get a different sound that you maybe yeah. uh, weren't able to, to sing things this way as you can do it now when you were 20. Yeah. So um, I... I, not... I have to say this because I'm a smoker, so I have to say something <laughs> positive about smoking. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Joe Cocker... What, was Joe Cocker a smoker or was he have just having a smoky voice without being a smoker? I, I think he was everything. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, not not only sense. smoking, he, he was everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, he was uh, definitely a Woodstock generation, which means uh, Absolutely. Yeah, these yeah. people were everything. Yeah. Um, so when you, when you um, kind of teamed up with us here with the blue guitar thing, um, I think you, you still have a, 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 an iridium which is not a finished um, mass production one, which is kind of an in-between right. prototype. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, I'm really proud of it. Hey, um, one day yeah, this, it's, it's, uh, this, this, this thing will be sh uh, worth shit loads of money one day because that's a one-off only in time, you know? So whatever. Let, let's see how, how Corona and COVID-19 goes on. <laughs> Maybe if, if I don't have gigs in two or three years, I have to sell this one. I have to, I have to sign it before that. From, Absolutely. From all, from and I, all I the band, Avantasia. I will sign it too because this is a special. You, you will one. sign it too, yeah. and and I would sell it for for millions. Absolutely, of lira. Yeah, yeah. lira, <laughs> <laughs> the old Italian uh, currency. Si, si, lira. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, you get a pedal board in front of you. Uh, so, so yeah. what, what what are the sounds that you are using? Um, with uh, the yeah, and, and uh, I think the people in the camera can't see it now, but what I have is is your prototype. Yeah. of the Blue Guitar Iridium Edition, which is sounding something in between the Mercury Edition and the Iridium. So it, ha it has got this, this modern uh, boost uh, section of the Iridium, which uh, allows you to give, give the signal more boost, with, with in, in, but in a, in a smaller range. Yeah, it's, it's not a that wide boost. Yeah, a bit more mid-focused. Mid-focused yeah, boost. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 the classic sound that I have is, is closer to, to, the, to the Mercury edition, also the, the vintage sound, sound which, is the, the, which are the both ca channels that I use most. Okay. Um, I, I, I sometimes use the modern sound, uh, the modern section for solos. That when I'm on tour with Avantasia, for example, I, I use this one. Um, but now with your modification with this, um, with this second uh, generation of mid-boost, I started to use the, the classic channel also as a sono channel with a, with a mid boost and uh, that's the next pedal with a tone burst. It's, uh, it's kind of a booster mm -hmm. uh, with, a, with a bass and treble control. 
um, by Mizubuki, but also with a with a with a gain control which adds a little bit of distortion and sustain without changing the sound. Right. This is a very interesting pedal for me because I always like it um, to, when when something is boosted for solos or for heavier riffs without really changing the sound with without adding any special mids that you maybe don't want to have. Right. If you like to have it, that's perfect. Um, but if you don't want to have it, if you want to keep your sound, this is the perfect pedal for me. Uh, then I have a, a, an, an MXR uh, Phase 95, the small version, mm -hmm. uh, with, a, with the option to turn it from, from the 45 to the Phase 90 mm -hmm. and to turn it into the script logo version. Mm -hmm. Very nice pedal, small. Um, and uh, what I have here is a, is a Spark Cembalo by Moore. It's, it's not that mm -hmm. really good, but it's the only one that still fits on this board. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have space anymore. The, yeah. the problem for, for me is, as a, as, a, as a guitar player, it's not a problem when I'm on tour, but when I also have to sing, for example, with my band Hartmann or other projects, yeah. I always need something with a small board where, where I don't have to spread my legs for, for two meters to yeah. get on every pedal when I'm uh, uh, singing at the same time. Close so I, I try spin. to keep yeah. it very, very, very tiny and small, uh, like me. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and and uh, one pedal that I still have on on this uh, board, I have it since years. On there is the Reptile Two by T Rex, a delay mm -hmm. um, that is in the effects loop, um, that is also having uh, kind of a flutter control. I can I can show it here. It's very nice. When you turn it off, it's like. <laughs> Turn on the, the, the phase. Exactly. Yeah. It adds a little bit of chorus. Yeah, modulation kind of thing. Yeah. But very, very small modulation. I like this very much. And uh, yeah, what else do I have? I have a halo of Bogner for sometimes compressing and, and boosting a little bit the clean channel. And I have a, an old real McCoy uh, Vava still in the ah. box. Uh, yeah, uh, box outfit. Yeah, yeah. Nice, really good. Nice. Yeah, show us some of the sounds. What's your clean tone? Maybe? Yeah, of course. Just a... My, I don't have a clean tone. <laughs> 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 I'm a metal player. Yeah, this is the clean sound, um, which I rarely use. That's what, that's, that's what I like about this guitar, um, especially with this pickup combination. Of course, it's, it's a Les Paul, uh, or a Les Paul kind of model, and it sounds like a Les Paul, but I, I really like it very much when the, when the neck pickup is really sounding very open. Yeah. Which, what, which still gives you this kind of chuck chuck, you know, in the what, attack. Um, yeah. Yeah, when I met you with this guitar, I was impressed how open that guitar sounds. And, I like this. This one really sounds very open. Yeah, and it's it's kind of an, a live guitar. It has you know a lot of dynamics you can play with. So it's 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 a nice thing. Okay, what what are you doing Absolutely. with the other channels? Yeah. What what? what? Uh, the, yeah, then I have this vintage channel, which is yeah like uh, uh, the the plexi in your uh, in your amp. Yeah. yeah. I like this sound very much. Mm -hmm. um, this also sounds good when you boost it with this tone burst. It's got enough gain, but you still have this vintage vibe in the yeah. sound. Yeah. Um, not filter too much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, then I have this classic channel, which is my let's say main channel for the for the most things that I use. Uh, it's 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 a little little more tight, mm -hmm. um, and I, your your uh, tone control, uh, this custom control is like halfway up, um, so I get a little bit of this let's say tight bass and mm -hmm. and a little more presence, which I need for especially for things like Avantasia, when it comes to heavier sounds. <laughs> A 
it's but it still has got this let's say classic approach that I like. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't yeah. like I, I don't like too let's say modern sounds. Yeah. Um, I, I I I like to to keep it more of like like uh, let's say vintage style sounds, but with this let's say little extra going to the modern Punch. world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean yeah. enough gain and enough bread. <laughs> for the yeah. modern word, without That's right. uh, losing the character, the warmth and the woodiness of the sound. Uh, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I also used rectifiers on tour, which which are great amps, of course. Sure. Um, which I like very much. Uh, I like them for playing rhythm mm -hmm. for special things, but I don't like them for for solo playing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's not not my type of thing. But but great amplifiers. Um, uh, but but I'm I'm more this let's say Marshall. Guy. I've always been into this martial words since since a kid. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to have a martial, and I also grew up with all these guitar players, as as Angus Young of ACDC, right, and, and uh, Gary Moore, and yeah. uh, Paul Gilbert, many many others, Malmsteen. Yeah. So, and they I, all played martials. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, when you visited me here in Saarbrücken, I uh, I saw your red martial. You brought it to to my place, so I know. Your Marshall, the wet one, too. Yeah, yeah. Hey, it's, 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 st it's still here. Yeah, 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 yeah. it still is. Yeah, yeah. And hey, there's another thing that I know, which is this gold topless Paul. <laughs> this one here. Yeah, yeah this one. Uh, this one. Th this one is mine, but uh, I, I still have yours. Let, give me a second. It's wait a uh, minute. Ah, you have you have more of these. I see. I have so, more. Yeah. Ah, okay. This uh, is this mine, one. right? This, this is yours. Okay. Yeah. This is yours. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, gave which, which, you, which you gave me as a present to my fiftieth birthday, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe, Thank maybe you. not. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gave it to Oli to to play it because I love uh, if guitars are in good hands. Guitars need to be played, and I I have this as my uh, gold top now, and I thought, you know what. Um, Oli needs to play that guitar for a while, and then we see what happens. You know, it's in good hands, and um, yeah, you, you seem to like it. It's a one. Uh, what what is it? Sip seventy. What was it? Uh, it's a seventy three. Seventy three deluxe gold top. Yeah, with a mini humbucker and, yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of yeah, thing. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And um, so, talking about music and Hartmann, uh, you have a new album coming out, or what? What's the deal here, or is it out? It's, it's already out. It's yeah. it's out since uh, the first month of Corona. <laughs> it's, it was released in the beginning of April, uh, so this was the first month with the lockdown in Germany. So yeah, uh, yeah. it has has been released on the seventeenth of April. It's called Fifteen Pearls and Gems, and it was also our anniversary album to our 15th anniversary. That's why we uh, have 15 tracks on this new record. We have five new songs. We have uh, five cover songs, yeah. cover tracks from other bands, our personal favorites, and we have five live versions uh, of songs we recorded with our band during the last uh, 15 years. Yeah. Cool. So um, we will listen to some of that stuff now. So Hartmann, um, to promote an album when there is COVID-19 is not a good idea, I guess, you know? <laughs> it's, it, it was very difficult for, for yeah. me because I'm also, let's say, the record label. Um, so it was really hard to draw the decision either to, to release the album or to hold it back. Yeah. Uh, because nobody knew in, in, in March, in the beginning of March, where I had to decide this, yeah. uh, what will happen. So yeah. we, we still did, the, did a video for the first single, which is a cover version of When the Rain Begins to Fall, as a duet with the, the great Ina Morgan, a very, very good German singer, female mm -hmm. singer, which is also part of Aventasia since last year. Yeah. Ah, we know okay. each other also since 20 years or 25 years. Yeah. And uh, yeah, she's, she's part, part of the family now too. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, right after we did this video, we released the, the record and everything was going fine uh, until uh, uh, the lockdown came mm -hmm. and nobody uh, was able to do concerts, to, to go on tour. So we weren't able to, to, to even plan a tour until now for maybe next year because it, it doesn't make sense at the moment. Um, yeah. But how to say, I, I don't want to, to moan too much. It's, it's the same for us all. And for many other people too, not only for musicians. So I think the only thing you can do is to, 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 to make the best out of it. Yeah, yeah, you use the time, design some M's like myself or write some new yeah, songs yeah, yeah, yeah. or, you yeah. know, be positive. So, solder, about... solder in and out new pickups and install new <laughs> yeah. bridges and stuff. Yeah, look That's at this. The last... <laughs> this. This is Man, what, yeah. I, this is what I, just, I do. I just closed it before our, our live stream okay. to give it a little better let's say look yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah could... I was i was really uh, had, uh, uh, soldering on this guitar like like uh, at, at 5 p.m this day yeah um trying trying out some some capacitors for for the neck pickup and yeah nerdy stuff yeah are, are you using uh, bumblebees you know this this uh not bumblebees but they have the same uh, value as ah, a bumblebee. Okay, yeah, yeah. These okay. are the not not silver mikas, but they are uh, silver ones by by uh, tube amp doctor, mm -hmm. and uh, they really sound good. Yeah, they're really good, and uh, yeah, especially with the fifties wiring, they they have more influence on the sound. Even if you have everything turned up full, yeah, um, uh, I, I didn't believe it before somebody told it to me. What a, what a big difference it makes, um, even when it's all cranked up to to ten. Yeah, and it makes a difference. Yeah, so it's so sensitive. You wouldn't believe. I mean, for me, absolutely. Yeah, yeah for, for me, it's it's also always, um, it's it, it's almost unthinkable from a technical point of view. I mean, you know, I know it's high impedance. There's one mega ohm input impedance or two mega ohms even, and then you have a pick, a pickup of whatever eight k's or something like that, and yeah. then the fucking capacitor type. It's the value and the type if it's a um, um, oil capacitor or what kind of capacitor yeah. makes such a huge difference. Absolutely. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I noticed that um, even even this um, cover um, braid um, from the wire, I can have this longer covering or shorter. It's like a little capacitance that I can still adjust. So if I want less high frequencies, I have to make this longer, covering the wire. It's, it's, and you it sounds a bit it. crazy to it sounds a bit crazy to me, but I, I really believe it. Yeah? yeah. So keep it open, you so you can use it during a show. Yeah. For the clean sounds, just <laughs> yeah. Pull back yeah. the cable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. It's yeah, so but crazy. It's, it's really funny what what difference things make. Uh, uh, when I first heard, for for the example, that, that it makes a difference uh, which way around you 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 solder in the cap capacitor this way or this way, I thought like it's, it's totally bullshit. But it makes a difference. It, Not on it, on every kind of circuit, of course. Yeah. But, but in a guitar like this with a with the fifties wiring, where where the uh, capacitor has more influence on the whole circuit, it really makes a difference. It's, it's absolutely. Really funny. Yeah. So for me, the rule is and the always... funny. The funny thing for for me is. Um, that knowing this after like 25, 30 years, um, it's, it's funny how things change how you see instruments because um, I think the same as you, we, we all had many guitars and liked them or didn't like them and we sometimes didn't find out what, what the problem is. You yeah. changed the pickups and you still didn't like it and maybe the, the only problem was the value from, from the volume pot or from the capacitor, maybe yeah. of course also of the guitar, but but yeah. with just little <clears throat> things here and there, you can still tweak it guitar into a special direction where you want to have it. Yeah. You can change the whole guitar, of course, but, sure. but uh, when 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 the basis of a guitar is good, then you can still tweak it in, into either this or that direction. Yeah, I th this is something uh, I think I, I also learned uh, over all the, these years. If you pick up an instrument or an amplifier, 50% is the substance of the instrument, the amp or a speaker, whatever. Yeah. And the other 50% is how to set up the neck, how you set up the pickups, and, yeah. and maybe what's wrong for you. 
you know sometimes you have yeah. a killer guitar just a different wiring or whatever yeah. uh, a different value or different uh, volume pot or a different capacitor will make the difference for you so um, absolutely just, yeah, yeah. that that kind of experience coming from nerdiness is helping and <laughs> once you un once you understand what's the, the theory behind it, it's very easy. And you can buy a cheap guitar having a great guitar because you know what you're getting, you know? It's like... Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's the same with amplifiers. I can yeah. still, let's say, remember when, when I had my first Marshall. It was a, was a tuned Marshall with an extra tube. Uh, so you had like, like uh, uh, two preamp tubes to get more gain, this typical 80s thing. And it was a great sounding 50 watt uh, JCM 800. It was really good sounding. Yeah. And, and uh, th then I fucked up something by, by, by uh, uh, turning around the, uh, the switch uh, in the back for, for, um, uh, for the cabinet and yeah. something broke. So I had, I had to bring it to a repair shop and he repaired it and mm -hmm. he also changed the, the, uh, the gain pot. Wow. And he just—he said he just wanted to, gain, to change the gain part to to give it more options to turn down the gain a little more, so that it's not always cranked up full. And and uh, I got the amp back, and it didn't sound the same. It never yeah, yeah. sounded the same. <coughs> never again. Then I yeah, sold yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's it's stories and stories and and a process of um, learning and learning. Um, yeah. I think we had a, a, a killer project last year in 2019 together um, in Mannheim, Germany at the Guitar Summit. Um, oh yeah, this was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm having the honor to be kind of the MD of the all-star band that plays there every year. So the first year we had Guthrie Govan, the, the next one we had as a star guest. Of course, a lot of other great guitar players and then Uli John Roth and then Last year was Paul Gilbert, and you yeah, know yeah. how it is. There is no time for rehearsal. There is a ten guitar players and no time for rehearsal. And um, the theme of the evening was Woodstock because last year was like fifty years of Woodstock. Regular shape, and at the end of the song, we go down, 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 like in pulse, pulsing. Okay, and we can, what we could do is we have this just as eight, and we will for you every time. But the songs are really good, though. Hoover is kind of a different riff, it's more like. And um, yeah. uh, uh, we had killer guys on stage. There was Henrik Freischlader. I remember Great guitar he, player too. Yeah, yeah he, he he broke a string in the middle of his set, and then um, he he went backstage and he couldn't find the string. Then he got <laughs> Billy Billy Sheen's bass, and he finished his guitar solo on Billy on Sheen's bass. In, yeah, in, that's cool. That's cool. That, yeah, you know, cool things happen like that, and um, yeah, I think um, for me it's 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 always very fascinating to work with this kind of people. And you've been the singer uh, last year, and of course the guitar player. Um, but we had too many guitar players anyhow. <laughs> too too many guitars, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think this was big. Too many fun. guitars and too many notes. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know. Um, I like to risk stuff, you know, we had we have uh, uh, things, you know, for me, I don't like the jam, like we all play Smoke on the Water with nothing special. And the other thing is, 
we cannot rehearse a show and I don't want to have a rehearsed show. So I, I'd like to have uh, something fresh um, that mm. still meets the songs, but on the other hand, gives the room for everybody to join in and, um, and be yourself. And um, I, I, I think we created a few magic moments. This, this is what it's about, I, you know. And of course, it was, we re it was really fun that evening. Absolutely. Yeah. There was some kind of some kind of magic here and there. It was, yeah, was yeah. also something very special for me because, uh, yeah, of course we're we're all uh, guitar players, professional guitar players, but we also have been kids that were listening to many other guitar players, and of course Paul Gilbert was one of my heroes when I was 15, 16, 17 trying to practice frenzy and stuff like that. And I said, <laughs> yeah. oh, shit, I, I can't make it work. How does he do it? So yeah. it was really funny to, 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 to meet him because, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, Eric Martin, the singer of Mr. Big, he's also a part of Avantasia. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so it was really funny to, to, to meet Paul Gilbert uh, during that event on Guitar Summit. And yeah, so uh, after this short rehearsal, I took the, the chance to say hi and, and to really ask him how you played one very special riff uh, uh, of, of Frenzy guitar solo on the first Racer X album. Because I, I tried every kind of voicing and I couldn't make it work. And then he explained it to me how, how he did it. And, and the funny thing was, that he said like uh, that he is not able to play it anymore <laughs> because he, he's got a different kind of pick holding technique as he no, had yeah. it when he was 20 yeah? yeah so he can't play it the same as he as when he was 20 that was really funny but at least i know how it how it works i can't play it but i know how it works <laughs> <laughs> you know this is all the secrets that we can take uh, to uh, when we get buried but anyway we know the secrets super cool yeah. Um, hey, I think um, this was a big pleasure having you on the show. We will surely have you back one day. And, um, it was a pleasure for me too. Yeah, and we will show you a little clip here um, what happened last year on Guitar Summit. And uh, thanks again, Oli. Cheers. Thank you. And everybody out there, stay healthy and have a good time. Yeah. Cheers. And stay nerdy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, before we show you the clip... I have the question of the day, but um, we had the, the, the question for us, which was, what is the thing that covers the, the, the top of a Les Paul? It's called a veneer. You had answered this in the chat here already. Okay, but the giveaway question for today is, um, is coming back to my Hendrix project. By the way, you can get uh, the DVD uh, at the shop.bluegitar.com and all the other music and stuff. But what is the song that inspired me where I stole the idea from? This kind of picking which I used on Purple Haze, my version, and the winner will get one of those Hendrix tutorial DVDs. Um, so, let me play that song where I stole it from. If you know it, please write in the comments and the first one who's got it right will get this DVD. song anyone knows hey it's not a Jimi Hendrix song <laughs> it's a song yeah what's the name of the song and it's a yeah Listen again.
So, any, any ideas here? Um, it's a song by... It's been played by... It's composed by Sting. That's my hint. I know, it's hard. Anyone gets the song? Huh? Bring, yeah, that's, that sounds good. Bring me the night version. Bring on the night. That's it. What? Alex Bayroth from Police Circle. <laughs> Bring on the night. Who, that, that's pretty good. Bring me the night. That's pretty good. Who was this? Veronica Canzares. Uh, Wherever you from, you're the first. Cool. So, um, you will learn how to play Hendrix. There are some backing tracks and there are some hints. Enjoy that one. We will send this to you. Please give us your address so we can send you um, the instruct the tutorial DVD. And now we show you what happened last year at Guitar Summit. Unfortunately, this year we have no Guitar Summit. Um, there will be maybe something uh, like an online version, but it's you know it's killer to meet all these people at Guitar Summit and. Uh, I have only good memories and um, yeah, enjoy our clip from last year and see you next week, Wednesday. Cheers, bye bye. Vielen Dank. Das war die Jam. Wir überziehen mit dem Hit von Woodstock. Den kennt ihr.
trying to dial up Until the boss is here, don't make it a day Help your son, but you're too young to vote I wonder, how am I gonna do? There ain't no cure for the summertime blues Gotta work a late. Times I wonder what I'm gonna do. There ain't no cure for the summertime blues. Yeah. <laughs>